a message called Carry to the Table, okay? And I, I want to pray because I want to make sure that um, the Lord speaks this morning. I'm not up here to give some sort of TED Talk, Netflix documentary. I am here to bring the word of the Lord. So would you um, bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for your spirit. We thank you that because of the finished work of the cross that we can have relationship and access to you. We thank you that your word says where two or three are gathered in my name, there you are amongst them. So Lord, I thank you that you are amongst us this morning. I pray that you would anoint my mouth, my words to speak, God, that I would speak what you want me to say, that I would get out of my own way, and that you would be present in this place, Lord. I thank you that you can take up your word and divide it into 20, 30, 40, 50, thousands of ways that it could touch each and every person in this room. And so, Lord, I thank you that you are going to speak to us this morning. I pray that we would be changed, renewed, and transformed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So this song, Carried to the Table, does anybody know it? Anybody remember? My mom does, which my parents are here. It's their first time in our new building. It's amazing. So they're awesome. They surprised me. They just showed up. They're like, we need to talk to Roman. I said, Roman, can you open the door? And there they were. It was awesome. So you guys need to meet them after service. But Oh, I also need to make a public announcement because I have been, this is Rila in the back here. And I have told all of you that her name is Ryla, because that's what I thought her name was her name. And then she came over for dinner, and she was like, I'm so sorry, but it's Ryla. And for months, I've been saying Ryla, so PSA, it's Ryla, and she's amazing, an amazing woman, and I need to get to know her. But I felt like I told enough of you that her name is Ryla that I needed to make it publicly correct. It's Ryla, okay? All right, that's just a side note. Um, but this song, Carry to the Table, Seated Where I Don't Belong, and I Don't See My Brokenness When I'm Seated at the Table of the Lord. It's a beautiful song. It's probably outdated now. Like, we listened to it, and I, mm, I can tell that was written a while ago. But the words are beautiful. But it brought me to the story of Mephibosheth. Can you all say Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth. Try to say that three times fast. It's not possible. It's, it's not even possible to say it three times in a row, let alone three times fast. But Mephibosheth, probably not a household name, probably not a story that you've heard a lot about. Does anybody know Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel? Ryan does for me yesterday. or Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's a story of Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel, and I'm going to give you a little bit of context, and I'm going to try to do what was taking me like 30 minutes to say in two minutes, okay? So you're ready to go on the ride with me about just a little bit of context of who Mephibosheth is. Is. Now, Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of King Saul, okay? So King Saul is the first king anointed and appointed by the Lord over Israel. As he becomes king, things kind of take a turn for the worse, and he is no longer God's anointed anymore. He has made some decisions, done some things. God has removed his hand off of him, and he says, Samuel, the prophet, that's why it's called First and Second Samuel, go and find a new king. He goes and finds a new king, David, who was a little shepherd boy who had 12 brothers, and his dad didn't even bring him out to Samuel because there was no way that David, my youngest, weak shepherd boy, was going to be the king. But what does God do? That's who God chooses. So David is now the next in line to be king. King Saul is still king, and through a series of events, David ends up being a general in King Saul's army. He is also best friends with Jonathan, King Saul's son. He is also married to King Saul's daughter. Okay, so you're getting the history here. David is in Saul's army. He is his son's best friend, and he's his son-in-law. Well, David gets a little bit of fanfare. Hey, that didn't take 30 minutes. Okay, I'm glad. I, I went a long way from the long, here, here we are. So, um, I feel like the mom is like, I never have. But we're going we're gonna to make it. We're going to make it. But King David, he kind of, there's a little bit of fanfare about him. People are starting to say that Saul has slain his thousands because back then the Philistines were after them. There was war. They were fighting. It was just the time. There is so much drama in this story. And I encourage you to go back and read it. And for anyone who tries to say the Bible in the Old Testament is boring, they are not reading it. If you just open your eyes... And you read it, you're like, what is happening? I read a verse, this is 
inappropriate, but it's in the Bible. I read a verse in this story that said David was asking for something for the price of 300 foreskins. That's, that's crazy, okay? And that's in the Bible, all right? So it's not boring, okay? It's a little bit crazy. But anyway, David, sorry, I was debating whether I say that, and I shouldn't have, but then I did. So here we are. What a price to pay. <laughs> um, so anyway, where am I at? So King David has become famous. They're saying that Saul slays his thousands, but David slays his tens of thousands. God is positioning David in the people of Israel, but Saul is insecure and he's threatened. Now Saul, you can again go back and read this whole story, but Saul is after King David and he wants to kill him. Jonathan and David make a pact. They make a covenant together. Jonathan's like, I'm going to help you get out of this mess. I'm going to make sure my dad doesn't kill you, or at least try my hardest. And you make me second in your command when you become king, and look after my descendants. So they make a deal. David flees, and in battle, Jonathan dies. And then Saul dies, mainly from his own doing. But they're both gone. Okay? Now... Here enters Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel 4, 4. I think it will be up on the screens. But it says, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. So... It's good to stay curious when we're reading the scriptures, all right? So they've heard that Jonathan and Saul have died, but why are they fleeing? So his caretaker, he's five years old, he's, he's five years old, he's lame in both feet now because they were hurrying and fleeing to get away. This caretaker has cared, can you imagine you're carrying a little boy and you drop him and his whole life changes? He can no longer walk. His ankles are shattered. There is no wheelchair. There is no plastic surgery. There are no um, artificial prosthetic. prosthetic, thank you, prosthetic braces for him. His life is completely changed forever from this moment. But why are they in such a rush? Why are they in such a hurry? Now they're in a hurry because in those days, it was customary in the days for a king of a new dynasty to massacre anyone connected with the prior dynasty. Now, they don't know that David's going to be the next king. They don't know what's going to happen, but they need to flee and get away because he should be dead. Because more than likely, this new king is going to come after him and anyone who was close to that dynasty. They were all going to be gone so that there was no threat that they would try to overturn it once again. Okay, are you, are you hearing this? So now, we find ourselves, we go a few chapters later, it just randomly puts in who Mephibosheth is right there in verse 4, and then it carries on. And then we find him again in 2 Samuel 9. We're going to read 12 scriptures. Is that okay? Okay. If you have your Bibles, open up your Bible, or you can read here on the screens, but stay with me here. It says, David asked. David's king now, okay? He's king of Israel. Judah, and he says, David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Because Saul's been trying to kill David for years, and David is such a good man. He had the opportunity to kill Saul multiple times, but didn't because he didn't want to touch the Lord's anointed, and he was just going to leave it up to God, which that's a word for some of us. We just need to give it to the Lord and let the Lord handle it. But he wants to show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Next verse. David said, Oh, no. Okay, I'm going to find it here in my Bible, don't worry. Sorry, got to go back, back, back. Is it there? I think we're at verse 6, and we should be at verse, that's okay. Um, Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan, and he is lame in both feet. 
Where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Everybody say Lodabar. Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, they're just really wanting you to understand who Mephibosheth is. They keep saying this over and over again. So many names. But he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? The king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always, always eat at my table. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. He had a seat at his table like a son. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. There they go telling us again. He is lame in both feet. Now some things we see in this story. Mephibosheth really deserved wrath. That's what should have happened. That's what would have happened if it was any other king. But he was met with King David's kindness. What else happened? The land was restored to him. There was a new king. David didn't need to do any of this. But he gave back. He restored to Mephibosheth, which really was his. Because it was going to go Saul, Jonathan, Mephibosheth. But now his story is totally changed. King David is king. But David is restoring the land to him that was his grandfather's. What else happens? He has a seat at the king's table. Not just any table. He wasn't just given a meal every day. This was the king's table. So they are eating good. They are eating the best of the best. They are drinking the finest wine. They have it made at the king's table. And he gets a seat every single day. And he is treated like a son. He's not just some stranger, okay, well, you know, I don't know if you've ever had that, like, at a work or school, and there's someone who wants to sit with you, and you're like, okay, you know, but you're just trying to, mm, not really deal with it. It's not like that. He has a seat like a son at the king's table. And what's so interesting about this story is where Mephibosheth went to hide. Mephibosheth, it says he was in the house of Machir. Everybody say Machir. Makir. This is why it's so important to stay curious when you're reading the word. You don't need a master's or PhD in theology to get more out of the Bible. You just need to stay curious. What I did is I said, what is Makir? Because all of these biblical names, they have meanings and they matter. Makir means sold or enslavement. And what is Lodabar mean? That's the land. So he's in the house of Makir in the land of Lodabar. Lodabar means pastureless or lifeless, where things go to die. Things don't live in Lodabar. So Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who's the son of Saul, is in the house of enslavement, in the land of lifelessness. That's where he's been for all of these years. Now, I don't know if you can see the parallels here in this story. But it's easy to see ourselves. I've heard this story taught one time, and it was about what kindness we can show to others. But there's so much more power. There's so much more transformation when we look at this story and we realize that we are Mephibosheth. There is a parallel here, a direct correlation. What King David has done for Mephibosheth is what Jesus Christ has done for you and I today, right now. 
our salvation is from him. King David took, he went and got Mephibosheth out of enslavement and lifelessness and brought him to his house and sat him at his table. And he said, you are like a son and you belong here every day for as long as I am king. That's what the Lord has done for us. And we are Mephibosheth. And there's a few things here. He was deserving of wrath and we were deserving of wrath. I want to read Ephesians. I know that's not very um, happy, but it's going to be happy, okay? But Ephesians 2, verse 1, if we can go to that on the screens. It says, as for you and me, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were in the house of enslavement, in the land of lifelessness before Christ. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now working those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. Just like Mephibosheth was, by nature, deserving of wrath. But because, read this with me, because it's good news. But because of his great love for us. Come on, say it with me. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, Mike, leave this up on the screens, because just like Mephibosheth, there is no way, even if he wanted to, he couldn't get himself to the king's table. He is lame in both feet. This man has to be carried everywhere he goes to get anywhere. He is totally and completely dependent. And we need to remind ourselves that we are totally and completely dependent on Jesus and his finished work of the cross because we couldn't earn it. It is not by works. It is the gift of God. It is not by works. It's not from ourselves so that no one can boast. There is nothing that we have done to make a way for us to get to Jesus. It is only God and his great grace and mercy and the riches of his love that brings us to the table. Amen? This is good news today. Because of his great work for us. Because of his great love for us. And we need to remember that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I know sometimes I've been a Christian for forever, and it can be easy to look at other people and their sin and think about how bad that is, and they should be doing that, and how are they doing this again, but we are all on the same playing field. It is only by the grace of God. It is only by salvation. It is only by Jesus' blood and body broken for us that we have a seat at the table. He carried us. We are Mephibosheth. The next thing is, just like Mephibosheth, we were shown kindness. He didn't have to be met with kindness. David could have killed him, but instead, his heart was to show kindness. And I love in Romans 2, verse 4, I didn't give you the verse, so don't worry about it, but it says, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not his shouting. It's not his shame on you. It's the kindness of our Savior that leads us to repentance. And I know most of us in this room, we've experienced that. The kindness of our Savior. When we were dead in our transgressions and sins, when we couldn't keep ourselves together, when we were struggling and we were sinning and it was over and over and over again, it's his kindness that met us every single time. And it's his kindness that brings us to repentance. What does the word tell us? That God so 
loved the world that he came to save. He didn't condemn the world, but he came to save the world. And this is good news. God did not come to condemn us. He came to save us, and he meets us with his kindness. And through his kindness, it then leads us to repentance. What does repentance mean? It just means to turn around and to go the other way. Where we were trying to do life our own way, just like that verse said in, I think it was Ephesians that I read, when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, just doing whatever we wanted and whatever felt good. Well, we were walking that way, and the wages of that sin, it does lead to death. It may seem good for a while, but it does lead to destruction. And all we do when we're met with this kindness is we repent, which means we turn the other way, and we follow Jesus. He's kind to us. The third thing is that he restored the land. He restored the land to Mephibosheth. And through salvation, sozo, it means saved in the Greek. We are made whole, we are healed, and we are restored. Amen. He washes us pure as snow. Where we were dirty and the blood was covering us, he washed us white as snow. He restores our lives and he restores our relationship with him. We once had communion with God in the garden and sin messed that all up. And there was a great divide. And he bridged the great divide for us. And now that relationship is restored where we can run boldly to the throne room of grace. We don't have to sacrifice animals and go through a prophet and go through all the steps. We can talk to God at any moment. We have access to him through Jesus. He restores. And I just felt to say for some of you, things that you're walking through in your life, that he restores. I forget where it is. I can look it up later in the Old Testament. It's in one of the prophets. But he restores what the locusts have taken. And I just felt for some of you, there are things that have just taken so long, and you are praying and believing, and he's a God who restores, and there will be restoration, yeah. and there will be restoration here on earth, and there will be restoration in eternity, because our pain only lasts for a night, but joy, yeah. it comes in the morning, and I just felt for some of you that joy is coming, yeah. it's coming, you hold on to hope. You hold on to faith. You don't let go. You stay close to Jesus. You remind yourself of his kindness, of his goodness. And you hold on to that because he is a God who restores. Yes. And he doesn't just do it for others. He does it for you too. Yes. Keep on believing. Amen. Fourth thing. Is this okay? Is everybody okay? Great. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> Valerie. Um, number four. We, just like Mephibosheth, he was treated like a son at the table. We, too, are adopted. We read in Galatians 4, 4 through 7. I don't know if I gave you. No, I have it right here. Look at me prepared here. 4, 4 through 7. It says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son Jesus born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. That's why we can call God our Father. He's not just King of kings and Lord of lords, but he is our Father. We are adopted in his family. So you are no longer a slave in the house of enslavement and the land of lifelessness, but you are God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. This is for you and I this morning, that we are adopted to sonship at the Lord's table. We have a seat at his table for eternity, that we are going to eat good with the king, and we are his sons and daughters. And that word there, adoption to sonship, in the Greek, let me find it, let me find it, let me find it. I wrote it down here. Oh, here we go. Adoption to sonship is a legal term referring to the full legal standing of an adopted heir in Roman culture. 
So when they said you're adopted to sonship, it wasn't just like you and I, you're part of the family, come on over. But then when you need a place to stay, oh, <laughs> nope, not staying here, you know, or we can say we're family. This was true. Adoption to sonship, to be a son and a daughter of him that we are now his sons and daughters. I don't know if you have that revelation, but it is good news that we are sons and daughters of the living God and that we have a seat at his table every single day. And the table, I love the significance of a table because what does a table signify? It signifies fellowship. What do you do at a table? You talk. It signifies relationship. That there would be dialogue communication. There would be friendship at the table. A little bit of vulnerability because people are going to watch you eat now, you know, and sometimes that can be messy. But there's friendship. There's proximity. There's closeness at the table. You eat with people you're close to. You have, you play games at the table. Think of all the good things that happen. It's family time at the table. And we, like Mephibosheth, are seated at the table. And I wanted to say three things, and then we'll close. The first thing about the table is that you belong at the table. I saw somebody wrote in a prayer request, and they said they, they were just struggling to find where they belong. And I don't know if you're in the room or not, but I want to say you belong here. You belong at our table, and you belong at the table of the Lord. The Bible says, whosoever will to the Lord may come, but you belong at the table. And I want you to get, I want us to get, how different would our lives be, and would we walk through our lives and our relationship with God, and we didn't see just God up here and me down here, but he is my father. He is my dad. He's not the person I run away from when things are going wrong or when I messed up or when I, all of us who are parents here know we want our kids to run to us. We want to help them with their problems. We want to help them with their doubt. We want to help them with their struggles. We want, we are their mother, their father, and God is our father. And you belong at his table. You belong at his table. Second thing, you matter at the table. You don't just belong. You don't just have a seat here. But you matter at the table. We are the body of Christ. And the Bible describes it like some are an eye, some are a pinky, some are a pinky toe, ow. Some are the shin, some are the elbow. But we all have a part to play. And when one part of the body is missing, it doesn't function like it should. We are the body of Christ. And what you Bring the unique gifts and talents that God has given you. You matter at the table. You matter to the body. You do. I'm going to say this, Mary. I said I sent you a message, but you bring so much joy and life into every room that you walk in. And it's so easy to talk to you. It is. It's so easy to talk to you. You feel like you belong when you're talking to Mary. You don't feel like you're an outsider. You're an insider with Mary. And you, that's a gift you bring to the table. Dijonay, you're a gifted communicator. And I know you try to run from it, but you are. You are a gifted communicator. And God has given you so many unique gifts and talents to speak the word of God. And you matter at the table. Valerie, your smile can change an atmosphere. You change the atmosphere where you go. And you matter at the table. Rila, you matter at the table. I got to have dinner with you and just your love for the Lord and even your love for my kids. Like you just ooze the love of God and you make everyone feel important. Like, you know, sometimes when you go to dinner and people have kids, you're like, hey kids, we're going to talk now. She's like reading a book to my boys. And I'm just like, you, you make people know that they matter. It's beautiful and you matter at the table. I could go on and on. So many of you. There's so much that you bring. Demetrius and Chloe, you are solid in your faith and in the Lord. And you bring a strength to our community that wouldn't be here without you. And I mean it. Not just a strength in who you are as people. 
because you are, you are steadfast, you are here, and you are a part, and you are serving, but your faith and the, the roots that go down deep in the word of God and the knowledge of God, it makes Sozo a safe place for people to come to, and you matter at the table. We matter at the table. You belong, and you matter. And the third thing is, there's room at the table. There's room at the table. I wanted to get a table that was like as long as the standing chairs. And maybe in a few years we have the budget and you know, all more volunteers, we can do all that. But just imagine it here with me, okay? There's this beautiful, beautiful banquet table and we're all here and we're having a good time and we're not gonna be like those people at lunch in high school, okay? I remember I'd gone to a Christian school up until eighth grade and I went to a public school and on the first day, it's lunchtime. And I'm quickly realizing all the people that I know here are not on my lunch time. Where am I gonna sit? That was my big, where am I gonna sit? So I was just slowly back in the line, you go ahead, you go ahead, get my boot, you go ahead, you go ahead, trying to figure out. And I remember this one person that I kinda knew from a class that I took at 8.30 in the morning, you know, like I just met them, it's like, you can come sit here. I had a seat at the table. <laughs> Chloe, don't be sad for me. I just, I'm in friends, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but it can be easy once we have a table and we have a group of people that we know and that we love to kind of make no room at the table. Because sometimes it's awkward. Sometimes people don't think like us or talk like us or look like us or act like us. or You know, then we can have differences that maybe we don't want them at, the, at our table. But there is room at the table. Lung says this all the time, and I believe it to be true, that the gospel excludes no one who doesn't first exclude themselves. That anyone who believes and confesses in their heart that Jesus is Lord, they are welcome at the table. And we all have our things that we go through. We all have that sin that keeps... You know, stum we keep stumbling across, but we're trying to be more like Jesus. But there is room at the table. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And listen to this, this is the key part. And gave us. Us, you and me, the ministry of what? Reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you hear what that verse is saying? It doesn't say it's the preacher's job to, to tell people about Jesus. It's somebody else's. It says God is giving us the ministry of reconciliation that you and I, in our workplaces, in our families, in our schools, in the cafes we frequent, in the restaurants that we go to, the people we know, the lady I see at Target every single week that says, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. I'm sure she's not supposed to be saying that at the Target self-checkout line, but she does. Every single week she says, praise Jesus, he's been so good to me. And I say, me too, ma'am, me too. She's living that verse out. We are Christ's ambassadors. And I used to hear this saying, and I might ruffle some, some feathers here, I'm sorry, but I feel to say it. I felt I needed to share it. But you know that saying that we all used to say, maybe you didn't, I heard it. Preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Anybody know that? Preach the gospel. But if necessary, then use words. Now, I get that. Our lives should back up what we say. If what we say, and we're saying God is kind and God is loving, and we're being real honest to people, 
you know, it's got to match up. But if necessary, use words. We are Christ's ambassadors. There's a verse in Romans 10, 13 to 14. And I didn't give it to you, so don't, don't worry. Um, 13 to 14, it says this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do we agree with that? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then? Can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone telling them? Everyone can be saved. Everyone should have access to the gospel. Everyone should know about the risen Savior that has washed away our sin, that takes away our brokenness, that we don't have to do life alone anymore. But how do they know if they don't hear? But I think it can be easy in the day and age that we live in is we leave it up to the speakers at the church to do that. Or we leave it up to an Instagram post to do that. But can you imagine somebody in their brokenness in the depths of despair, and you open up your mouth and you say, there is a God who loves you, and there is a God who is with you, and there is a God who took your pain and your brokenness, and he took it upon himself, that you don't have to do this anymore, that there is supernatural strength, that there is supernatural joy, that there is supernatural peace, that there is a firm foundation that you can stand on when the storms of life come. Imagine those words being said. It's powerful. And I want to implore us, yes, live a life worthy of the call. Live a life that's an example. But if you have the cure for cancer, I think you're going to tell somebody. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves that this isn't just a religious activity, but I believe this. And I'm preaching to myself here. But I believe that God has risen from the grave. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the only way. And he is the only truth. And he is the only life that whosoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but could have eternal life. When we remind ourselves that I really believe this stuff, the power of the Holy Spirit stirs up within us. And we can speak and we can tell people the good news. Because it's good news. Those people on the streets who are saying, you know, blue do and whatever, that's not the gospel, right? The gospel is that God didn't come to condemn you, but he came to save you. And it's his kindness that will lead you to repentance. And I just want to implore us, church, to remember there's so much room at the table. There's so much room at the table in our city. And I want to end with this, and you can stand with me. I didn't think through how I wanted to completely end this, but here we are. But I want to implore us this morning and remind us that we are God's ambassadors, that he's left the ministry of reconciliation up to us. And this church, I believe, is here in this building for a reason, that God's called us for such a time as this. There are so many people who don't know the Lord and who need to know. At Northwestern University, at our high school, in our workplaces, we need the church to rise up and remember that it's our ministry. We have a ministry. We belong at the table. We matter at the table. And there is room at the table, and it's on us. To shout from the rooftops, what, is, what did that verse say? It's in Corinthians that, that God has made himself sin for us so that we get, yes, here we go, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Go to that last part of the verse. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. 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 So I encourage you this morning, church, encourage you this week, Reflect on this word. Let the word go to work in your life. Ask God to show you and lead you and guide you. And I truly believe that if we wake up in the morning and we surrender our days to the Lord and we say, God, I'm your ambassador, I think we might be surprised at the opportunity and the conversations that we can have. 
to implore the world around us that Christ died for them.